Now, in the cystic lesion category, I think one of the things we can do if we're very careful is look at the range of cystic lesions and recognize that if we study them, we can be very specific in many, many cases. And so, for example, serous adenomas have a range of appearances, but they're benign lesions. And if you know it's a serous adenoma, in the absence of just symptoms, the patients can be followed conservatively. Serous adenomas do not become malignant, but they have a range of appearances and they can be challenging. Typically middle-aged or older women, about uh, 50% are asymptomatic, but the majority are discovered incidentally. Other patients can have abdominal pain. And the main reason is because these lesions can become very large and anything large enough can obviously cause symptoms. We talk about serous adenomas as a complex cystic lesion with thin septations and a central scar. Um, that's the most classic appearance. If you fluid sample these with EUS, they contain glycogen, but no mucin. And again, an middle to older age female is more classic. We talk about three main types, polycystic, honeycomb, and oligocystic. The polycystic is the most classic and most common type. Um, the cysts within the lesion typically are multiple, measuring under two centimeters. Classically, it's reported that you have a central scar, though I will admit that with serous adenomas, you can have other areas of calcification, including in the periphery of the pancreatic gland. Honeycomb is the second most common, where the cysts are smaller, more, more cysts are present, but under a centimeter in size. And oligocystic, which can be the most challenging, uh, can be confused with other lesions, particularly mucinocystic neoplasms, because often there are well-defined cysts in the two to six or seven centimeter range. And as the age group overlaps with MCN, they can be more challenging. This is as classic as it gets. A cystic lesion, it almost looks like there's soft tissue components, multiple septations, faint calcifications. Now, the thing about serous adenoma, the septations, in my experience, like this, are better seen in the venous rather than the arterial phase. It's often said that with serous adenomas, you never see a dilated pancreatic duct, but the answer is you can. I mentioned stellate calcifications are classic, but you can see other patterns of calcification like this example where the calcifications are in the periphery. But you can see on the venous component of the exam, the septations, the cystic components are much easier to see. Another example, large cystic lesion pushing on the stomach. You see modeled enhancement. It's over 12 centimeters in size. You can see when I do the MIP imaging, it has lots of vessels and the vessels are kind of going through the lesion and around the lesion. One of the things that people talk about, and I'll show you an example in a moment, is that serous adenomas can look like neuroendocrine tumors because they often can be very vascular. One big difference is with serous adenomas that the vessels like this case are stretched. So you talk about a stretch of the vessel. Here's the patient's GDA, hepatic artery, being stretched around the mass, which was a serous adenoma. In patients who have neuroendocrine tumors, the vessels are going to be irregular. And here, as we go from arterial to venous, you can see the multiple cystic components of the lesion a lot better. And you can see how quickly the lesion, in fact, does wash out. Um, in terms of vessel involvement, arterial and venous structures are typically displaced. They're not invaded, but occasionally, just because as things get large enough, the portal vein and SMV especially can be compressed, which you can see a little bit in this case. Here's another serous adenoma. Again, prominent septations. You can see very nicely the septations here. And if you look at this case, what else could this be? It's not the appearance of a mucinous tumor. Mucinous can have septations, but not so many septations or so many cystic spaces. It's not the look of a neuroendocrine cystic type tumor. It's not the look of an IPMN. If an IPM was this large, it would obviously be malignant and you would have nodularity in the wall. 
this is just going to be a cirrhosist adenoma, very nicely shown. And again, I find that the coronal views can be very helpful, really giving me a good feel of the appearance of the lesion, particularly its interface to bowel, interface to vessels, and interface to liver. And as Linda showed you some nice cinematics, you can get a very good feel of septations, particularly in cystic lesions, when you look at these on cinematic. And then the honeycomb pattern we talk about, multiple tiny cysts. Here's just an example. And again, the overlap between the lesions is uh, fairly uh, common, uh, but I think the appearance, the central calcification, and we just, you can see, I like the fact that it does have a little scalloping on the portal vein. As I mentioned, we talk about the vessels are not involved, but you can get mass effect and scalloping on the portal vein. And you can see it very nicely here as well for cirrhosis adenoma. So a range of appearances and a range of sizes. We sometimes can see cirrhosis adenomas in the two to three centimeter range, but I would say the majority of cases we see like this one are greater than five centimeters in size. And as you look at them, you get a feel of what you're looking at. I mentioned the oligocystic are the ones that tend to be the biggest challenge because looking like MCNs, here's a cystic lesion, tail of pancreas. It's really hard not to say it's an MCN. Could it be a pseudocyst, a large IPMN? You can go through a differential, but it's not an IPMN. Uh, without a history of pancreatitis, it's not going to be a pseudocyst. So cirrhosis adenoma versus MCN is really what you're going to be stuck with. Patient 65, it's more likely cirrus. Patients 45, it's more likely MCN. And you can see it very nicely here on the MIP imaging as well. One of the things we do at Hopkins, as Linda showed you on pancreas also, is we do a lot of post-processing. So the ability to look at the vessels, image on your right, looking at the MIP, or doing things like cinematic rendering, we do find it very helpful. And the last thing I'll mention, the most challenging cirrhosis adenoma is the solid variant. The solid variant, if I read this case, to be honest with you, I would say there's a mass in the tail of the pancreas. It's solid and it's vascular. It looks like a neuroendocrine tumor. Cirrhosis adenomas at times have a variant that's solid and they look identical to neuroendocrine tumors. And it's really tissue sampling that allows you to make the diagnosis because I would be going with a neuroendocrine tumor. Again, in terms of management, although it's a benign lesion, patients will get surgery when they're symptomatic. Some surgeons feel that lesions above 5 cm should be operated on because the lesions continue to grow and it may be more difficult to operate later on. Uh, once patients, uh, once there's uncertainty, now there's fluid uh, mapping. There's a test from University of Pittsburgh that can almost diagnose with 100% whether a lesion is a cirrhosis adenoma or not. So usually surgery is rem remaining what you do in patients who are symptomatic. Now, mucinous cystic neoplasms kind of look at times like cirrhosis adenomas, but it's a younger age patient. It's usually body or body tail of pancreas. There is no communication with the pancreatic duct. And although they're large, you don't see duct obstruction. Um, typically, the thing about serous, about mucinous cystic neoplasms is looking for septations or nodularity. Most people will agree that if a mucinous cystic neoplasm is 4 cm or greater, it will always get surgery. All mucinous cystic neoplasms have a potential chance of malignancy and people do not follow MCNs. There is an argument now if MCNs are smaller, surely under 2CM, can you follow them? There's some consideration for that, but once they're 4CM and in most cases 2CM or better, the patients will get surgery. Now you can see, if you look at this case of MCN, you can see why a little bit it looks like a cirrhosis adenoma with those septations. MCNs can have calcification centrally, but more commonly in the periphery. You can see the septations here. Once I see septations and the wall is thickened, to me, I'm worried about malignancy or at least a, a high-grade dysplasia in the tumor. 
Obviously, you don't want to resect lesions when there's malignancy. That's a little bit too late. You want to do it when it's medium to high-grade dysplasia where you can cure the patient. So when you're looking at these cystic lesions, the wall looks thickened and you see septations. That's a mucinous cystic neoplasm and that lesion is going to come out. You can see the septations nicely on the cinematic rendering as well. And I think on the cinematic rendering, one of the things I do like is the ability to show the septations. Here's another case, 5CM septations. Now, this was operated on. This was low-grade dysplasia, but I don't think anyone's going to worry that the patient got surgery unnecessarily. Once it's over two, surely over four, the patients need surgery. And once you see these septations like this, these patients are always... Uh, from an imaging perspective, you're going to worry about high-grade dysplasia. Patients will get EUS, but the EUS is not going to be all that helpful. It'll help make the diagnosis, but it's not going to be a great predictor or excluder of eventual malignancy. And here's just another look at that lesion. And here's just in 3D. Now, this case is a bit easier. The lesion's larger. You see on the uh, left wall, there's nodularity present. Once you see nodularity in the wall of the lesion, and surely you see multiple septations, the lesion wall is thickened, the lesion is large, this is likely going to be high-grade dysplasia, if not frank malignancy. So these patients will end up with a distal pancreatectomy. And this patient was lucky. It was not yet malignant. It was high-grade dysplasia. But that's why these are the lesions we don't follow. We simply, when it looks like this, will take the lesion out. Now, one of the things when we think about cystic pancreatic lesions, we don't think about much are neuroendocrine tumors. All of us see lots of neuroendocrine tumors, but typically we think about hypervascular lesions uh, ranging in size from five millimeters to 10 centimeters, but cystic neuroendocrine tumors do exist. One of the things that's critical is they have peripheral rim enhancement. They can be associated with MEN syndromes, but the thing about them is they're very challenging. I showed you before a case of serous cyst adenoma where solid neuroendocrine tumors can look like serous cyst adenomas. But cystic lesions, we always go through that differential of IPMNs, MCNs, but you got to think about a neuroendocrine tumor. And one of the challenges, of course, with these neuroendocrine tumors that are cystic it's often on the arterial phase and the arterial phase only that you see the vascular component. It often washes out quickly. So if you only had venous phase imaging, it can be somewhat challenging to reach the right diagnosis.